Next from Springfield, we talk with former Illinois State Senator Mark Rhodes about his book, Land of Lincoln, Thy Wondrous Story. And we hear why he says Illinois has been so influential in Washington, D.C. over the decades that the nation's capital should be considered in Illinois County. This runs about 35 minutes. Mark Rhodes, your author of the book, Land of Lincoln, Thy Wondrous Story, and we appreciate you joining us on the Illinois Channel. Glad to be here. You were yourself, uh, at one point, uh, part of Illinois history. You were serving in the Illinois State Senate, and uh, what, what years were you a part of that? Well, before I was a member of the State Senate, I worked for the State Senate uh, starting in 1971 for Russell Arrington, who was the minority leader of the State Senate. Uh, former Governor Edgar and I were on staff together. Then I came, I left Illinois for about four years in 1973, so I was largely absent from the state uh, during the Governor Walker administration. I was out in Washington, D.C. I returned to Illinois in 76 and ran for the state senate when my predecessor, Terrell Clark, retired. And then I served in the state senate for the next six years, two terms, a four-year term and a two-year term from 1977 to 1983, all of which was Governor Thompson's time. Now, you, you're out in Washington, D.C., yes. you've been out there for some time, and you, a lot of people don't know the uh, Illinois State Society, and in fact, uh, your book, The Land of Lincoln, I Wonder a Story, is kind of a, a history, not just of Illinois, but really it's uh, told on two tracks. That's right. And, and you connect uh, the history of Illinoisans in Washington yes. with how... Washington intersected with Illinois. You, yes. You know, the state of Illinois is 102 counties for those who haven't counted. You refer to Washington, D.C. as Illinois's 103rd county. Correct. We've, we, we, on the average, we've had about 700 people from Illinois over the course of many, many decades from 1854 to the present time who have either worked in Illinois for an administration or worked for members of Congress or our students, military, journalists, lobbyists, all sorts of people who come from the state of Illinois who we came up with this metaphor of the 103rd county because the two stories are closely interrelated. One is the story of the Illinois colony out there, but because their membership was made up of people from all the other 102 counties from Illinois, they, they first came to Washington, they first organized in about 1854 it was called the Illinois Democratic Club of Washington City. These were government clerks before civil service who wanted to remain loyal to uh, President Franklin Pierce. And the comical thing was that the name changed to Illinois Republican Club of Washington, D.C. right overnight when Lincoln came in in 1861. And the names changed back and forth. If there was a Democratic administration, it might be called the Illinois Democratic Association. And finally, things settled down during World War I when all the state clubs of Washington became nonpartisan and uh, supported President Wilson for the First World War. Do you, do you know offhand, uh, well first of all I was going to ask, what was the origin of why did they form a club to begin with, you know? Gee, I don't know. I think it was just uh, the, uh, the earliest records that I have are from 1867. We got a letter actually from the University of Illinois, uh, a letter of invitation. It was just to be that what it is today, essentially a booster club for Illinois in Washington and uh, sort of a cure for homesickness so that people could stay in touch with what was going on in the state and also to welcome visitors from Illinois uh, who came out to Washington and be a support organization for the Illinois Congressional Delegation, which is, it has been for the, almost the entire time. I, I don't want to make this all about the Illinois State Society because the whole, the whole book is really uh, the, the story of Illinois and, right. and, and key people throughout the years, but you're um, obviously a historian and uh, spent a lot of time writing the book, but do you have any way of assessing t to what extent is Illinois' uh, power footprint within Washington? Oh. How does it compare with other states? It's probably bigger than, let's say, in Nebraska, but is, is it uh, as big as uh, what it seems to be? And obviously, as we say this, we got an Illinois in the White House. I think so. We have, we've had four Illinoisans in the White House. We had Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, Ronald Reagan, and uh, Barack Obama. So 
we've had uh, three speakers of the House from Illinois. We've had lots of majority and minority leaders of the U.S. Senate from Illinois, a few Supreme Court justices. So it's been a very large impact. I would say maybe Ohio would come in number two and uh, other organizations such as the Texas State Society. But uh, Illinois has had a very big impr imprint, if you will, or footprint, I guess, on Washington, D.C. history. When, when you uh, wrote the book, first of all, why, why did you write the book? Well, it was a challenge. At first, it was only about the Illinois State Society and its history. The challenge was to track down a rumor that Abraham Lincoln had been a member. Well, when I tried to verify that rumor, I couldn't really do it because Lincoln was so busy during the Civil War, obviously he didn't have time to leave the White House to go to meetings and that sort of thing. However, the Illinois State Society did go to him, a couple of hundred of them on the day, the, the day after his inauguration on March the 5th, 1861, and that I could document through contemporary newspapers of the time. And gradually, the story got more and more interesting because because I found out that Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was a very active member of the of the society, and many members of his cabinet, including John Hay, who later became uh, Secretary of State under President McKinley, and a great many people, their stories sort of wandered in and out the door of the Illinois State Society while they were uh, had uh, a tenure in Washington D.C. Um, when you I'm going to let you cherry pick one of the stories. Who are some of the most notable Illinoisans that have gone off to Washington and had some major impact on the history of the United States? Well, I think Everett Dirksen would be a, a big major example. He was both very active in the Illinois State Society and, and of course, majority leader, excuse me, minority leader of the Senate starting in 1959. Uh, and. Uh, he had a relationship with President Lyndon Johnson because they were, had both served as leaders of the U.S. Senate. And Dirksen was a key person in getting the civil rights legislation in 1964 passed through the Senate. Uh, and he had a very long-term impact on, on Washington politics. Um, as you say, there's Grant, obviously, Lincoln. Uh, but interesting, too, there's... If you go to Washington, the House members are housed in three different House buildings That's right. inside the Capitol. You have the Rayburn, uh, Longworth, and Cannon, All right. uh, and two of those, Longworth and Cannon, are named for Illinoisans who became House Speakers. That's right. And uh, Joe Cannon uh, was, of course, from Danville. He was Speaker of the House around 1905 to 1910. He was rather autocratic. He caused a a bit of a rebellion among the junior members of his own party. And we, our personal connection to Cannon was through one of the State Society presidents, a man by the name of Oscar Ricketts from uh, Ashmore in Coles County. And uh, Oscar was a printer, and he was all set to be appointed as the public printer when the incumbent printer died in 1905. And unfortunately, his patron, Joe Cannon, decided to get into a public feud with Teddy Roosevelt the same week that this was all going on. And uh, Joe Cannon said to a reporter from the Washington Post, um, Teddy Roosevelt has no more use for the Constitution than a Tomcat has for a marriage license. <laughs> and so, anyway, the, our, our poor man was out of, the, out of a job by the end of the week. But it, did, it actually did him a great favor because it forced him to go out to the private sector and become a printer and become a rich man over the next 17 years. And then he returned to the Illinois State Society in 1917 as our first president under the new name. Well, the other thing, I'm, I'm going from memory here, but wasn't Longworth also Teddy Roosevelt's son-in-law? He married Alice Roosevelt Longworth, yeah. Uh, so interesting that the, he and his father-in-law... Yeah, she, she lived a long time. I, I met her back in about 1967 when she was in her 80s or 90s. Very, very interesting lady. I can remember her uh, you know, being around uh, in the... Early, she might have died in the early 70s or somewhere, but I remember uh, her being around. Yeah, that's well that's years. possible. Yeah. Um, when you uh, started doing the research on the book and you break it through the uh, yearly chronology, you go through some of the major chapters and all, but uh, you wouldn't have known all of that you found out and subsequently learned 
Were there stories that, as you got into them, surprised you? Oh, yeah. I, I think one of the most interesting ones was about Charles Lindbergh. People don't associate Charles Lindbergh with Illinois very much because he was from Minnesota. His father was a member of Congress from Minnesota on the Bull Moose ticket and later the Republican ticket. But his roots in Illinois started about 1925 when the Chicago Tribune hired him to go down, fly down to Murfreesboro to cover a tornado. There had been lots of damage and a, he was supposed to be met at the airport by a Chicago Tribune photographer reporter with some glass plate negatives to take fly up to Chicago so the Tribune could have an exclusive on this terrible damage in Murfreesboro. Well, one of the competing newspaper guys came to the airport with blank plates and Lindbergh got in his plane, flew back to Chicago and he hated reporters ever after that because it was such a dirty trick the newspapers tended to be very, uh, well, very competitive. So then later, in 1926, he signed a contract to supervise the mail route from Chicago to Peoria to Springfield to St. Louis and back again. And uh, the problem was, the, for the first nine months, everything went fine. But when they got into some bad weather in the fall, uh, Lindbergh had two forced parachute jumps on his record one over Ottawa and one over Bloomington and uh, the aviation minister of that time was from Illinois, a former attorney general by the name of uh, William McCracken and McCracken was worried that the next time he thought Lindbergh was reckless, he was worried that the next time Lindbergh instead of going down over a farm he might go down in populated territory over Chicago or its suburbs or something like that so they the backers in St. Louis of his attempt to cross the ocean came to McCracken and pleaded with him, please don't take his license away from him. And McCracken basically said, okay, he, can, he, he stops flying the mail in Illinois, he can prepare for his flight, once he's out over the ocean, he's no longer my responsibility. So Lindbergh made it, and then of course after Lindbergh was successful in crossing the Atlantic Ocean nonstop, he and McCracken later did become friends, and they both became uh, big advocates for aviation safety. So that was a story I didn't know. I, I knew nothing about Vice President Charles Dawes, a fascinating character, for, uh, not character, but a fascinating business leader from Evanston, Illinois who served as Vice President of the United States under Calvin Coolidge from 1925 to 1929, largely forgotten now. But his, his place in history was really interesting. He was the great-grandson of William Dawes, who rode with Paul Revere the same night that, they, that Paul Revere rode to spread the alarm that the British regulars were coming to Massachusetts towns. And his brother Rufus Dawes was head of the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. Very prominent family and he also won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1920. Yes, yes, he was the incumbent vice president and, but he was winning the prize for something he had done before he became vice president. And on top of all that he wrote a popular song called It's All in the Game which became one of the hit parade tunes of the 1950s recorded by everybody from Tony Bennett to Elton John. Sure. So a very diverse uh, career that he led. An interesting person, I don't think most Illinoisans today would know who he was or re even recognize the name. Now, I've actually driven by his home in uh -huh. Houston. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, he's largely forgotten and I didn't know any of that, that what you just said. When you, when you uh, put together a book like this, how did you decide to organize it? Well, it was, uh, it was, my attempt was to do it in chronological order uh, based on newspaper clippings, newspaper archives from the 19th and the early 20th centuries. In, if you don't mind an analogy to C-SPAN, these state clubs were sort of the C-SPAN of their time because newspaper reporters covered them very closely. They discussed po public policy issues and uh, this was where people floated uh, various proposals that they might have to become legislation later on. For example, absentee voting was first floated by the state clubs of Washington, D.C. because they were tired of negotiating special rates with the railroads to go home to vote and they decided it would be a good idea if they could vote by mail. And there were some other policy ideas that they came up with. 
Uh, so we, I or, mostly organized it through these newspaper archives, which are a wonderful resource because it takes you back in time. It's like a, a time travel in a sense. And where do you, uh, when you looked at these newspapers, where were you? The, do you go to the archives, National the ar Archives? No, uh, it was all, I was very lucky because I came along just at a time when all this stuff came online um, through a company called ProQuest, which was able to digitize the uh, old microfilms of the Washington Evening Star, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times. And it was a wonderful resource because you could search by subject words for free. And then if you wanted to buy a copy of the article, it was about $1.25. So it was a very economical way to do the research. That's interesting. And we were just talking off camera. I was just saying I happened to, uh, at an estate sale, buy two newspapers on the yeah. day John F. Kennedy was inaugurated. And they're, they're each a time capsule. Of yeah. They don't know what's coming up. but. The, all about what did they think at that moment. So those newspapers are great to capture that thought process that was going on at that moment. Well, as an example, I, I bought an old copy of the Chicago Daily News. Uh, I didn't buy it. Somebody gave it to me from the day that World War II ended in VJ Day of 1945. Buried in the back section is an article by John F. Kennedy, who was a reporter covering the San Francisco Conference to create the United Nations. And it, again, it's just a wonderful time capsule. I have another uh, uh, example from the Washington Post that uh, lists what an amateur community theater was doing. And there was a young woman by the name of Helen Hayes Brown who was playing uh, Little Lord Fauntleroy or something like that. And she grew up to be Helen Hayes, the first lady of the American stage, and married to an Illinoisan. Uh, uh, Mr. MacArthur, who was the author of Front Page and other uh, Chicago reporter. Uh, we talked in the beginning about the Illinois State Society. You know, it occurred to me, I remember uh, Howard Baker from Tennessee once yes. said, the thing that ruined Washington was air conditioning because Congress used to go home and they were That's right. Here all year. That's right. When on the other hand, today they go back and forth every week. They, it's kind of the Tuesday through Thursday crowd of Congress, and then they're home in their districts. I can imagine when they stayed up there, because it was train travel, you wouldn't be going back and forth, that the state societies were influential as far as you say, kind of keeping people maybe informed of what was going on within the state. But what role do the state societies play in this day and age when Congress travels back and forth? So, so well, they, they tend to be the booster clubs. And I think it's uh, a wonderful thing that they make such a strenuous effort to be uh, nonpartisan because there aren't that many venues left in Washington where people can just sort of informally get together and boost their state uh, without getting entangled in all sorts of partisan controversy. You, when you served in the Illinois State Senate, were a Republican. Yes. Uh, one of your friends was uh, former Mayor Daley. Yes. Uh, the, the younger. Uh, yeah, that's right. Richard Dam, uh, who obviously is a Democrat. So, what you know, we're, what do you think about partisanship these days? Is it more pronounced than it had been in decades past? Or yes, it certainly is in Congress. Um, I suppose that started. Uh, there were a couple of flashpoints in recent American history. One was the um, nomination battle over uh, Robert Bork to be a Supreme Court justice when Senator Paul Simon was on the Judiciary Committee, he basically said it has been customary to simply approve whoever the president wanted for his major post, but th that custom was broken in the Bork nomination because they, they openly said, now we're going to challenge him on the basis of philosophy. If we disagree with the philosophy, even if he's the president's choice, we're going to uh, not vote to confirm him. So that was one of the flashpoints. The other was when the sort of psychological trauma that the Democratic Party went through when they lost the majority for the first time in 40 years. Newt Gingrich brought in a new Republican uh, majority. So that was a, sort of a shock to the system because they were just plain used to being in the majority. They never had to worry about anything other than that. So uh, yes, the, this, the situation has gotten more ideological, more partisan in Washington. I, not quite as much in Springfield, but uh, still rather uh, tensions in Springfield I, uh, that I've seen that I didn't see when I was a member. 
I know we've, uh, the Illinois Channel's twice gone and covered uh, the inaugural right. uh, balls that uh, you've put on uh, with uh, both times Barack Obama becoming the president. Um, you have uh, you have a ball really every year. It's not just for when an Illinois in the White House or whether it's a Democrat. We have a ball every four years. Every four years. I yeah, starting uh, starting in 1861 with Lincoln, uh, pretty much an unbroken chain, and uh, it's a very uh, good thing for Illinois and a good thing for our political community because they are scrupulously nonpartisan. I was thinking today about the 2005 inaugural. I don't think you were there at that particular one. It was Bush's second inaugural and we had everybody from both parties in the Illinois delegation including uh, Senator Barack Obama who was then a newly elected senator including Senator Durbin and uh, Speaker Hastert, Republican and Democrat co-chairs of the of the uh, event and then we've had many governors come out uh, to to chair the events. You know we were just talking about the influence of Illinois and the power footprint it might have and it occurred to me, I mean here we had the President of the United States, Dick Durbin is the number two man in the Senate and, right. and we again just had the Speaker of the House uh, right. recently with Denny Hastert. Right. I, I can't think of another state even you know California or New York that have had that kind of no, that's power right. imprint. No that's right. That's right. Um, on the other hand, when we uh, talking about the history of your book, and you and you go through any number of chapters, and as you say, you can really read the book. Uh, I mean, you can read all the way through, but you can also read kind of one segment. You after can cherry another, pick, yeah. Cherry pick the stories. One of the things that's going to be interesting coming up that people may not have focused on as yet is that Illinois is going to be noting uh, its bicentennial. The two hundred anniversary will be in twenty eighteen. Right. Um, let's talk about that uh, on one hand I would think this book uh, would give you some nice insights into a lot of history that uh, we've talked about. But it's sort of a launching pad for that celebration I think. Uh, we were very much involved in the sesquicentennial in 1967-1968 and that was uh, very well uh, done I thought. Governor Kerner was a governor at the time. Illinois companies such as Illinois Bell Telephone got behind it and uh, it was a, every part of Illinois, every town, got involved in some way. You know, when you, uh, you just mentioned uh, some of the, the, the companies, and we also have in Illinois not only power politicians, but we have some of the major corporations uh, in the world here. Right. Uh, ADM, McDonald's, Abbott Labs, Caterpillar, John Deere, and the list goes on. To what extent does the Illinois State Society, uh, do you work with companies? Are you facilitating anything with them or is it? We do, state? but we, we are not lobbyists. We, our bylaws do not us, permit us to lobby on behalf of legislation at all. There is a separate group that we work with called the Illinois Group. Now that group is cons composed of uh, public affairs lobbyists in the state uh, who represent Illinois companies in Washington such as Motorola, Archer Daniels Midland, uh, uh, many of the companies that you just mentioned, and now Boeing, because Boeing is now in Chicago. So that, that's a separate group that discusses public forum, public policy issues in a way that we don't. We tend to be more civic and, uh, and social. When you, uh, when you look at the history of Illinois, and as we just noted, we're going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary. Um, what, do you, what would you want young high school students to take away from the history of Illinois as, and, and to absorb as they think? Well, we got a grant from the Illinois State Society to uh, send the book as a gift to every high school library in Illinois and every college library in Illinois. And I was particularly pleased by that because that's the target audience that I most wanted to reach. Anyone who enjoys Illinois history I think would enjoy the book, but especially these students. I think one way that students can relate to Illinois history is relating to the people from Illinois history, not just names and dates and events, but uh, to the interesting stories. For, for example, in Peoria there was a couple by the name of Jim and Marion Jordan. They became very famous on radio in the 1940s as Fibber McGee and Molly. It was a very uh, popular show. In doing my research I found out that Jim Jordan had actually played basketball in Peoria 
against Fulton Sheen, who later became a bishop of the Catholic Church and a national religious broadcaster, one of the first famous national religious broadcasters. That was just an odd uh, little angle that I didn't expect to find, and, but it was fun. And I think that kind of fun story is something that uh, young students can relate to and maybe learn a little bit more about Illinois history than they would in a straight timeline listing of events. The Black Hawk Wars happened and then the Civil War and then the Spanish-American War. That's not what's fun about re, uh, studying history. What's fun is studying about the people and what they did and what they accomplished and against what, uh, what odds they accomplished. It. Yeah, a lot of times you know, we forget that people, these people live full lives. Yeah. Uh, you were mentioning Charles Lindbergh and right. uh, having to parachute out of planes that were going down over. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if high school kids know who Charles Lindbergh is at all, they just know him for what he did in one 36 hour period of his life for flying across the Atlantic. Correct. Uh, yeah, but you can extrapolate this all along, you know, with Ronald Reagan and the rest of the people. And I, to what extent do you think by reading some of these stories will conceivably uh, students go, you know, here's a guy who struggled with some issue or was a failure in something, even though he later became uh, a major figure in history and, and therefore kind of go, you know, these people were real people. They weren't just, you know, we have a, a bust of Lincoln often behind you. I think a lot of times people look at these historical figures as if they were chiseled in stone and weren't real right, people. Right, right. Do you, when you write history, is that something that you purposely tried to do, is to bring out the aspect that these are real yes, people? Yes, that, that and the fact that I tried to give some geographic balance. Illinois is a very diverse state, but of course Chicago tends to, uh, to dominate the news, the history, but there are many famous people in the, from entertainment, from literature, who came from downstate Illinois towns, and I think I had uh, lunch in Champaign on um, Saturday with a gentleman who was a historian from Pena, Illinois, in Christian County, and uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. We had a president of the Illinois State Society who was the chief administrator for the White House for 30 years from Herbert Hoover to John F. Kennedy, and this man was dumbfounded. He said, Somebody from Pena, Illinois held that position? I said, yes, his name was Frank Sanderson. He said, I've never heard of this man. And that, that, that would make it worthwhile if I could uncover stories like that, especially for local historians and genealogy clubs and the rest of it. I think that's, what I, that's one of the things I'd like to see is try to do for the bicentennial in 2018. And, you know, we were just talking uh, before we wrap up, but we were talking off air uh, again about how many Illinoisans are in high positions. On one hand, you might think, well, that's because of Barack Obama, but people of both parties uh, and people who are not even political per se. And we were just recounting, everyone knows, of course, the president. And you got Arne Duncan as education secretary. We just had Ray LaHood, a former congressman, was transportation right. secretary. Uh, Terry Gaynor, who was the head of the Illinois State Police, is now head of security for That's the, right. uh, I think the Illinois Senate or the U.S. Senate, rather. Right. Uh, and and really, the more you uncover, uh, one of the presidents of uh, C-SPAN is from Springfield, Illinois, Rob mm -hmm. Kennedy. Uh, so in in private business up there, and in, uh, in and out of a political elected office, it's amazing how many Illinoisans are. Well, there and there are a lot of writers and editors. Um, Al Regnery from Hinsdale, Illinois, is Regnery Publishing Company. He was a contributor to, I believe it was the American Spectator. Uh, Bob Terrell from Oak Park, Illinois, a uh, graduate of Fenwick High School. He's a very prominent uh, writer out there. Andrew Ferguson, who, who was also from Hinsdale. Uh, just a wide variety of people who some of them know each other, some of them don't know each other, but that's why we have the Illinois State Society to try to bring them together to, to get these various uh, stories. Well, a prominent DC journalist right now is Mark Plotkin, who's from Chicago. I don't know whether you know Mark, but he is a commentator on DC politics. At our annual meeting, Mark came, and also George Ann Geyer, who was a columnist for the Chicago Daily News for many years, a graduate of the Middle uh, School of Journalism. The current uh, medical news reporter for Fox News in Chicago is Dr. Mona Kana, and we, we teased about that because Dr. Kana was our Illinois cherry blossom princess in 1988. So there's all kinds of different uh, connections 
that that are can be explored that people can relate to under gain a little bit of understanding about, about how somebody from a small town in Illinois can become a famous person uh, even if you don't know about them uh, before we close out, if someone wants a copy of the book, do you know how can they get a copy? After October 21st, they can get it in stores or through Barnes and Noble and for until then, there's a pre-publication discount direct from the publisher in Ottawa, Illinois. 1-800-426-1357 uh, is, is the number to call and they'll get about 25% off the cover price. And uh, can people join the Illinois State Society if yeah. they want to get more information? Sure, they should just go to the website www.illinoisstatesociety.org. When they go there, there's a history page link and they click on that and they'll find my history blog where there is just as much material in, as in the book, if, if not even more, from photo albums by decade from the 1850s on to the present time. And, and, and lastly, uh, just off camera here, I have setting the Illinois Heritage Map that is, uh, tell us what that is, and then you also just recently heard from a school teacher. I did. That was kind of an interesting story. Yeah, the, uh, we, we, produced the, we produced the Illinois Heritage Map in the year 2000, basically to be a walking tour of Washington, D.C., of Illinois-related sites. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial is an obvious one, the Grant Memorial is another one, but others that are less obvious, uh, the home of uh, uh, Senator Majil McCormick, other places in Illinois that are related, all of the, the whole area around Union Station. The uh, fountain in front of Union Station was done, designed by Laredo Taft, who was a sculptor from Peoria. Uh, so we wanted people to have the ability to walk around and see these Illinois related sites in DC. And I was surprised when a teacher from Peoria County recently contacted me. He said, oh, we, we are using your heritage map in a course that we're doing. And I said, well, how? Because it's a walking tour of Washington. What good is it to you in Peoria? He said, well, we're using Google Street View to follow the directions on the map to wa virtually walk past these various monuments such as the place where the Grand Army of the Republic was uh, celebrated, uh, an organization that was founded in Decatur, Illinois in 1866. We, we have some other things that are very interesting relating to other famous people from Illinois, not as famous as Grant and, uh, and Lincoln, but John A. Logan from Murfreesboro is buried in, uh, at the Logan tomb in Washington, D.C. So we had some sailors this year from the USS Abraham Lincoln who presented a wreath on behalf of the Illinois State Society at the tomb of General Logan because he was the founder of Memorial Day. So there's lots of different things that can be learned and uh, my hope is that students will find this more interesting as time goes on. I'd like to merge history teachers with drama teachers and perhaps put on some shows that celebrate local people from all of these di different towns. All right, Mark Rhodes, we appreciate you joining us. And uh, again, the book is called Land of Lincoln, Thy Wondrous Story, Through the Eyes of the Illinois State Society. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.